So uh, with a grant from Coastal Carolina University, um, as Eric said, I was able to come and visit the special collections area at the University of Iowa. Um, I worked with him, Liz, and the rest of the team to see not only miniatures, but also suites of fine prints and lithographs. Uh, since my visit in summer of 2021, I've been able to start this body of work, the Casting Fingers, Casting Blame. Uh, your special collections area gave me exposure to many works at a small scale, both in terms of the book formats, as well as the types of imagery. Um, and I'm really excited to see how it continues to influence this project. It is an ongoing project. Um, so tonight, I'm going to, in addition to showing you where I'm at with this current body of work, I'm going to show a little history of my work. Just for context, I'm going to show a few examples from the collection as well. Um, over the years, my relationship to printmaking has grown to include sculpture, mixed media, installation art, digital, and performance slash community collaboration. Um, I really hope that through this presentation, you can see not only this evolution um, and how some of my past research interests are connecting to this project, but also the inspirations taken from the special collections area. So thank you again for having me. Um, so I wanted to start out <laughs> with a piece from undergrad um, and talk to you all about a little bit of my initial interest in printmaking. Um, it started with relief printing. Uh, printmaking is very much about storytelling and the narrative. And so I also wanted to include this piece. I think I was in the third or fourth grade. It's one of the first stories I ever wrote. Um, but I really love the connection between text and image. And that was one of the things that was great about coming and seeing all the miniatures and the books in your collection. Um, I grew up with my dad reading me stories as a child. Um, and you can see at a young age, I was taking a lot of artistic license there because I apparently got tired of counting the stripes on that zebra. So therefore I did not draw them. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to show you that and talk, you know, emphasize that interest in the narrative and storytelling. Um, uh, some of the influences um, are illustrations from storybooks uh, that I would look at uh, as a child. Um, I was actually lucky enough to get an early copy with the, the plates printed from this book um, at a little used bookstore. So I love uh, looking at Henry Holiday's engravings. Um, Growing up, I lived in a very rural area, and so I didn't get a lot of influence or uh, exposure, I should say, to contemporary or art history. And so when I was in high school, I saw this painting on my high school art teacher's calendar, and I was like, oh my God, what is this? Can art be this? Um, and then learned late, later in college through studying uh, Northern Renaissance art all of the influences that Bosch had on all of these other artists that I love in terms of their level of surrealism. Um, I think any printmaker that does not show Goya and Daumier uh, <laughs> is, is maybe like, I think you always see Goya and Daumier in a printmaker's presentation. Um, the reason that I like to share them is their use of the narrative, but also their ability to show uh, the darker side of human nature uh, with the use of humor and satire, but also Goya is so good at using humor and showing the more uh, comical sides of human nature as well. Um, so my work in undergrad explored relief printmaking and color reductive techniques. Um, I was learning a lot in terms of a visual vocabulary. Uh, I went on to graduate school and continued studying this color reductive process, but I started exploring and developing my concepts a little bit more in depth. Um, I've always been interested in relationships and how we treat each other. And as an undergraduate, I thought that's what my work was about. But when I got to graduate school, I realized that wasn't really what was happening conceptually, but I was able to apply the skills and techniques to start to explore those ideas. Um, after graduate school, I had the opportunity to do a large installation piece, and so I started combining printmaking with sculptural pieces. I was sewing and stuffing uh, relief blocks that were printed on fabric and casting figures, working with clay and then casting them in different materials, as well as doing some assemblage with found objects. And so that little bit of teaser started sort of 
lit the fire and opened the door for me in terms of my interest in sculpture. And so a lot of, I think what Eric mentioned, he said, I think he said I was an expert in lithography. So I think I'll have to live up, live up to that through this uh, PowerPoint. Uh, in about 2012, um, I, I should say this, when I was an undergraduate, I took lithography and I was like, I do not like lithography. I'm never doing lithography again. What is this? It's wizardry. I don't, I don't understand it. So but I went, I, I had the opportunity to go to Frogman's print and paper workshop, which actually I heard is going to be at the University of Iowa this summer, which is really exciting. I went to this workshop as a graduate student and it changed my life. Um, I took some lithography classes with Richard Peterson. Um, I got to work with him, um, having him as a mentor. And in about 2012, I decided, you know what, I'm going to get okay at lithography. And so I started drawing on stones. And if you've never done lithography, um, what you see here in the image on the right, there are two little chunks of limestone. If you like drawing with charcoal pencil or colored pencil or graphite, um, it's it, there's nothing like drawing on a stone. Um, you can draw on plates as well. Um, when you ink up and print the image, you sponge the stone with water so your greasy ink stick, sticks to your greasy drawing and the water rejects the ink in the non-image area. And by placing the paper down on the stone and running it through the press, that pressure transfers the drawing from the stone to your paper. So on the right, you can see the original drawing on the stone. On the left, what you see is the first layer printed on a piece of paper in preparation for printing the second layer for the embossment. And then this is the finished piece. So you've got the embossed layer after you remove those wires in addition to that lithograph. And so in 2012, I started making a series of lithographs and I felt like, okay, I'm learning lithography. Um, you know, most of the pieces are about relationships that I have with other people. Um, they're about loss. They're about, you know, trying to balance, uh, you know, the one on the left is about like trying to balance being a woman and all of these different ways that you can get pulled in life. Um, it's about making choices and questioning those choices. Um, so I just continued to make lithographs for a few years, working at different residencies um, and combining lithography with screen printing as well as mono printing and mono typing. Um, and so during these years, simultaneously, when I was at um, like that start of that process, I was teaching at MTSU where Kara was actually my student. And um, I had the chance to work with Christy Newell and she showed me how to use the laser engraver. And so I started laser cutting paper and laser cutting prints. Uh, this is a silk screen that I used the laser cutter to burn the ink off of the surface. Um, I started laser cutting matri matrices that I could use for printmaking. Uh, the image on the left is a collagraph plate. It's just a piece of matte board with acrylic medium painted and it's dried so you can see the brush strokes. And the little pieces of paper, the crutches were laser cut. So the image on the right is the resulting print. You can see the embossment and the stencil block created by those little um, laser cut papers. And then the door and the lady are both relief blocks printed on top. So digital became part of my working methods. Um, Mixed media work and collaboration became part of my working methods. Um, I always, so I teach and I think collaboration is Im important. I think we can learn a lot through collaboration. And I tell, you know, I try to do one project a semester with each class that's collaborative. And I tell the students like, what would you rather do? Stay at home and eat your frozen dinner by yourself or go to a potluck? Like, I want to go to a potluck. I want to be surprised. I want to try something I wouldn't have tried. Now, am I going to eat this at a potluck? Probably not. Um, but I can make art with it. 
So I collaborated with one of my colleagues, uh, former colleagues. We had been talking about making chicken nugget babies for months, just working in the studio, chatting with each other. And so this was play. It was fun. And so I, I prepped these chicken nuggets and made a collagraph out of them. And we made this collaborative print. It opened a door for me, though, in terms of relating back to my my studio practice. And I started thinking about, you know, printmaking's opportunity with the resulted image compared to the materials used to create that image. Like the image on the right, you might not necessarily recognize it as eggshells. Um, you can see the plate on the left, but the, the conceptual base connects to the materials used. Um, I used cookies. I laser cut cookies on this one and printed the cookies. Um, and so using all these different variety of media and materials starts to become about how through the translation of printed matter, our relationship to what that original material was can change and grow, even though the reality of what created it does not. And I'll talk more about that in just a moment. Um, at this point, you know, up to this point, I had been working in lithography, relief, digital, mixed media. So having all of these experiences up to this point, I have continued their use. And so I kind of want to provide this context to talk about how I'm taking another big step towards the current project, um, but in different manners. I mentioned earlier that right after graduate school, I had the opportunity to create a sculptural installation. Um, in hindsight, it really lit a fire. It has been a working method that I continue to explore. Um, in more recent years, I have still been creating editions of works on paper, but I have been I've been a lot more conscious about how can I use the matrix? How can I use these repeated impressions to create one of a kind pieces? And so that's where you can start to see that show up in some of these pieces. So using the repeated lithograph, you probably recognize that from the earlier lithograph to create these one of a kind collages with mixed media, you know, using color for variation, drawing on them with colored pencils, you know, because you put a lot of labor into the prints that you make. Um, I There was a quote that my predecessor said, and, and I know it's it's a former president, I think, that said it. It was like, if I had eight hours to shop, chop down a tree, I'd spend seven hours sharpening my ax. And that's very much what printmaking is a lot of times. It's very labor intensive. So moving into like thinking about the flat print constructed from multiple images to create one of a kind pieces, but then segueing into combining that with sculptural works and installation works. Um, these are some source images for a piece that I started in 2017. It took me about a year to make. Um, there's chicken skins in it, not actual ones. Um, but again, thinking back to the idea of what the original component is, those chicken skins, these I made through uh, creating a, a soft silicone mold from raw chicken skins. And then after removing the chicken skins, I cast them with wax. And then I took the photographs and I and the image on the left, I laser cut the photo references into paper. So they're very, very thin. You can see light passing through them. They're very delicate. Um, the image in the top right is a detail of the collagraphed paper. I also took the raw chicken skins and created hard castings that I then used to create blind embossments in the paper. And then I laser cut the text. And so this is the finished piece. Um, it's it's pretty tall. It's about six feet tall or seven, seven no, 26. I'm not good with math. It's six or seven feet tall. It's bigger than I am. But it was the first time in a while that I had created something sculptural since that previous installation, but using it in a different way. Again, um, you know, you've got the cast chicken skins, you've got the impressions of the chicken skins. Um, and so I mentioned previously about that sort of removal of the original form to see that printed matter. I think things that I'm thinking about a lot of times when I'm making work is how context 
can create content and perspective based on our experiences. Um, the reality can be the same, but based on our experiences, our opinions might shift. So like in this piece, you don't see the original chicken skins, but you get to see their castings. You get to see the empty impressions that are left behind. Um, I think that when I think about relationship to self, our, our opinions of our reality can change without the reality of what is there changing, what is actually happening changing. I think about like one like example I always go to because it's like an easy one is like, oh no, I'm running late. This is bad. And then you come ac across a car accident and you're like, oh my gosh, this was so good that I'm running late. Another example I like to think about is my hair. If you have curly hair, people like to come and touch it and pet it without your permission. Now, I guarantee you if it was growing out of my armpit, people would not come up and try to pet my curly hair, right? But that's the thing is like the reality is the same. It's just hair, but our context really forms our perspective and our relationships to our reality, you know? And that's, you know, that's a fun jokey thing. But I think also like, I think a lot about processing thoughts and how we may have like as a human, big emotions, big feelings, but through time and through space, even though whatever happened did not change, our perspective on that reality can change just by having that space and time to process. Um, so taking one more step towards what we're gonna talk about with the current work, um, I got the chance to go do a residency in Mexico and this really changed how I think about my, how my work engages with the public. Um, it started my journey into collaborating with the community. I don't know if I should call it performance art, but I guess there are some performative aspects. Um, up to this point, other than work talking with people at live printing events, I had never really considered collaborating with the community on my artwork, but I applied for this residency in Mexico and it opened up those doors. Um, I got to go there and they had an aviary. So I got to work with birds because if you haven't noticed, I like drawing birds. Um, and while there, I got to work in their community print shop. The image on the left is an image of me etching my stone at their litho press. The image on the right, I'm actually sitting outside the studio. So I am inside of the door on the right in the picture on the left. And then so this uh print shop was inside of a printmaking museum. It was open to the public. So I would sit outside and draw every day and just talk to people when they came to the museum or walked by. Um, in addition to this, based on my research when I was there, I was uh, working, researching a convent that was there. And based on that research, I decided to pick words inspired by the research. So what I did was I walked around Puebla with my broken ability to speak Spanish. And I would ask people to pull a word out of the bag based on the word they chose, they would make hand gestures. And I started photographing people's hands. And so this was my sketch on the right. I do a lot of digital sketching. And so the image that you're seeing on the left are the lithographs that I created. And then when I got home, so the, the drawing parts are lithography. When I got back home to my home studio, I used monotyping and laser engraving to create the background. So the background is inked a solid color. And then I, I drew on a piece of cheesecloth, scanned it into the computer, and then burned the paper to expose the paper underneath the ink, if that makes sense. And so that was a little, just a little nerdy process talk. It's a lot of fun. Uh, but in addition to that, um, based on the different words, I made other images, but I also built a table. And so the image on the right is a digital sketch. Again, thinking about these parts and pieces, putting them all together in different ways. Um, and our studio, uh, I learned how to use a biscuit cutter, thankfully, or that table would not work. <laughs> um, but I had a colleague who was a sculptor and she was really helpful. Our laser cutter was only 18 by 24 inches. So I had to laser cut these in sections and assemble them afterwards. And so I built an arm wrestling table. Um, it is not to regulation in terms of height, but it works. And so I really, I really like to think about, um, you know, communication, um, how we, like our internal communications with ourselves, 
but our communications with other people. Um, you know, people are arm wrestling here. The quote unquote loser thinking about that hierarchy is going to have their hand pressed into that stone. Um, but when the piece is finished, like you don't know who the loser is, you know, and honestly, if you're having communications with people, we need conflict, right? A lot of times, again, people think it's bad or good. You might think it's bad in the moment, but later you might realize, oh, we needed to talk about this, right? So what you see here, I'll show you the full piece in just a moment, but the little splotches are the grease from the hands that were printed and the birds are meant to be seen like eating them because it's to me conflict is nourishment we need to be able to communicate with each other it's not always comfortable um but there's really like if you think about it in terms of winners and losers like nobody really wins right so uh, these these are the things that i like to think about um with the work and so this is one of the more recent installations of this piece. Um, so the image that I showed here, these are the lithographs that are cut out and then they're suspended with the table. Um, and so people can still come up and continue arm wrestling because who doesn't like to arm wrestle? Um, and so now, finally, I get to talking about our my experiences with the special collections and sort of where I'm at now. Um, so I got the chance to come to University of Iowa as well as University of North Texas in that same summer, and I saw so many books. <laughs> I have so many pictures, uh, but also I think it was you, Liz, that brought out just this giant book of lithographs and fine prints, and I was just like, oh my god, this is fantastic, you know, like a kid in a candy store sort of experience. So this is not a miniature, though I came to the collection to study the miniatures. Um, but I just wanted to include some of the beautiful prints that I saw when I was there. Um, like really, just really great to see see these like use of exaggeration and distortions. Um, and just really beautiful prints. Um, so I just I just had to say thank you again for showing me that. Um, this is a screenshot of like one of hundreds of pages of my Google photos. I, I don't know, I don't know. I was like, maybe I should count and see how many pictures I have before I talk tonight. But I was like, oh, I don't have time to count all those. Here's another page screenshot. So I really got to see so many pieces while I was there. So I'm really thankful for, for that, having that variety in terms of seeing all of these images at a different scale and being able to touch them instead of just looking at photographs. Um, but I wanted to pick out some that stuck with me more than others. Um, with these set in particular, this is all of them together with the jeweler's loop so you can get a sense of the scale. Um, one thing I, I noticed is that, you know, some of these items are drawn life-size, like how they would exist in the world. Some of them are smaller than life slightly. Um, some of them are smaller than life, you know, quite a bit. So I started thinking about with my current project, like how scale can impact how somebody might interact with the tiny drawings that I've been making. Um, and here's another example. So a lot of these here are life size or close to life size, whereas all of these are smaller than life. So the way we engage with the image is quite different, right? This is a very small, it's obviously like narrative storytelling, whereas these, it's like, oh, these are little specimens, right? So I think scale is something that I was thinking about before in terms of the size of the drawings, but definitely thinking a lot more, more now in terms of what it is I'm actually putting in those spaces. Um, and then this leads us into what I made after. And I've got a few more pictures from the collections sprinkled in here because I'm going to kind of kind of go back and forth. Um, so Eric mentioned this project. I got a grant through Coastal to do it. Um, and so I, I got this idea during quarantine, during the pandemic. And I started thinking about, God, there's all this finger pointing going on. You know, um, I like I like cliches, finger pointing, you know, what can I say? But I, I started thinking about, you know, I mentioned earlier about com how communication is really important to me. And I think it's just think communicating with others is a skill that we need to foster and to nourish. Um, and so I was thinking a lot about how 
I, through through the quarantine and through isolation, communication ways had changed quite a bit and still are different now in terms of communicating in a more like having a higher concentration of indirect communication daily, as opposed to just like walking out your door and talking to somebody immediately. And how for me, I don't know about you all, but for me, the indirect communications led to more confusion. <laughs> and so, and possibilities for miscommunication, but also just wondering like, how do we deal with conflict in a time where we're not having a lot of direct communication? And so that was something for me that I had to learn how to navigate. Um, but I also think it, it may be potentially allowed avoidance of conflict. And I don't know how healthy that is necessarily. So these are some of the things that led me to uh, starting this project. And um, this is an image of a dart, if you don't know the vocabulary for the parts of the dart for when I talk about it. Um, and so what I started doing was I started casting people's fingers, literally. And so um, I asked people to come up and they'd stick their finger in the cup. And they say like, well, what are you doing this for? And I tell them about the project. Well, I'm going to make some darts out of your finger. And they're like, okay, well, that's weird. Okay, I'll do it. And so um, I like the idea that it's like one, they're small, right? So thinking back to the miniatures, except for this one finger in the top middle, that one's like gigantic, but the rest of them are fairly small. Um, but I started asking, I started having conversations with people because as your finger is is setting in the alginate, which is the mold material, it takes a few minutes. So I ask people to name their fingers and they say, okay, well, that's weird too, but I'll do that too. And then as they're sitting there and we're waiting for the, the mold to set, I ask them to think about the last like year at that time now, like a couple years ago, um, to think of a word or a feeling that might describe, you know, how would they describe the last one to two years of their life? And so essentially each person that I interacted with, uh, created a first and last name for their finger. And so you can see here, like Sally struggles. You can guess which one came from the description of the last couple of years. Uh, burnt Todd, disapp disappointing Dalmi. So I ended up casting um, 60 fingers total and each one has a first and a last name. And so from there, I started creating prints and images. And so I'll talk about the inspiration behind the prints and images in just a moment. I guess I should mention, I, I also had shoulder surgery during all of this, like before this happened. And so that was before I came to Iowa, I think, but about six months after my surgery, I went to um, UNC Pembroke and I worked with the students there and we did some finger casting and they helped me work on printing some of the drawings from the earlier fingers that I had cast. So the image on the left is the stone with the drawings. Each drawing is 1.5 by 1.5 inches each. And there's two drawings per finger because there's two words per finger. And so while there, we um, also made the prototype for the first finger dart and it had its maiden voyage. So you can see here, can you all see my screen? Hang on one second. Can you see my screen? Okay, cool. This is its maiden voyage. So it worked, yay. <laughs> and so you all can still see my PowerPoint, right? Okay. So while I was there, we made the prototype, we printed the first edition, and I also was doing some testers for the, the balloons. Um, you'll see in just a moment, the pictures from the actual finger dart event. I put media in the balloons so that when they pop, they will go onto the plate. So these are just, um, this is an aluminum plate with lithograph with grease and um, gum Arabic. And we played around with some drawing material on the surface too, but just to get a, an idea of what it might look on the surface after it's printed, after the balloon pops. And so this is kind of, this is <laughs> what happened after that. Um, I made a lot of prints. Uh, this is 60 images total-ish. Um, this is about half of the collection. And you can see the finger darts assembled on the right. Um, and so it says fall of 22, but I've been working on them, the drawings and the prints. That's about over a year, I think. Um, and so I wanted to show this because I think it really relates to miniatures and 
book binding and folding and cutting. Um, this is the process for turning the, the flat prints into the darts through a template system. And then these are some images of the prints. And so each one, you can see the names on this one, the top right square that gets cut out. So it would be the two lithographs and the two silk screens. This is Sally Struggles. So you got a picture of Sally Jesse Raphael. And then this image was inspired by the word struggles. Um, this one here on the top left corner, those two are Challenge Lame Lucy was the name the person gave that finger. So I got an explosion of the challenger and a picture of Lucille Ball. So each person's finger, I get to interact with their experiences through how they named their finger. And then I interpret that through the images that I choose. I know the one in the top right corner I remember is Anger Morgan. Um, the one in the bottom right corner was Hurry Up and Wait. So I, I have all of these, like a lot of them I have memorized in my head. Um, but it was it was really like, I don't know, it it was really like, I felt like through this process, even though the relationship that I'm having with others is still indirect, it, it, it was, it's offering me something that an email does not, you know, it's offering, it's offering me something that I feel like I've, I've personally been missing over the last few years. I mean, it's been different the last year. So it's, it's hard to talk about it in this, this context, because things are starting to change a little bit, but then we have these like ebbs and flows. Um, so I know that this one was ostentatious sugar with the peacock and the sugar cubes. Um, and so, yeah, so that's kind of where I'm at right now um, in terms of the number of lithographs I've created. I'm about halfway done. So I have another 60-ish drawings to make and I'm planning on getting those done in the next, hopefully by the end of summer is my plan. Um, and so this is this was like where, I felt like the fun was like really starting in terms of, you know, the finger darts getting out into the world. And so what you're seeing, the image on the left is a dartboard that I created to just like hold all of the darts so that people could walk up and see their names and choose. Maybe you want to throw fermented constipation. You know, you get to choose the dart that speaks to you and you also get to interact with how somebody else has felt about the last couple of years. So to me, it's this opportunity to present, you know, people's thoughts and feelings to others so that they can have an opportunity to connect with that or maybe have a laugh about it. You know, we have to laugh sometimes. So I set up outside on campus. Um, these are the movable walls that I built and painted hot pink because why not? <laughs> and uh, the image on the left are lithograph plates. The balloons have oil in them. The image on the right are mat board and it has acrylic medium in it. Um, the next time I do it, I'm going to put actual paint in it because once it dries, you can't really see it. So, um, and here's some pictures of people throwing. Um, I'm going to show you all just this quick video. I'm not going to click the, the video interview, but I'll, I'll, it's on my YouTube channel if you want to watch it. Okay, awesome. So it was a really fun day. Like again, again, I got to have candid conversations with people. We got to laugh um, and I gave away prizes. Um, and so where I'm at right now is figuring out like what what's that next step in terms of, like I know how I wanna present the darts to the public and that body of work with the current installation, but I'm playing around with some different ideas for how to really give each individual print a voice, each individual person a voice, because I think a lot about finger pointing and, you know, we have these platforms to express our opinions and not everyone, not all voices are the same loudness, like some voices are louder than others. And so through the display of the work in like a gallery setting, I want to make sure that each individual print gets its due. And so I'm playing around with some different ideas for how that might be presented. Um, so this is kind of one idea that I've, I've been playing around with and then potentially doing like a very large piece with all of them on there. Um, but I wanted to show you all a few more pieces. You know, the irony of like seeing all of these different types of books and formats 
is I kind of just want to go back to doing like an accordion fold. <laughs> like this was, this was me like folding things together. Cause I've been like working on, I'm processing, I've been processing the big plates that I showed you on the walls. Um, I processed some of them during Christmas break and I've been processing some of them since school started. So my next step is I'm going to print these. Um, the plates are like 24 by 36 inches where the balloons were popped on. So I'm planning on, I'm going to print those and then I'm going to laser cut parts and pieces out of those and make dartboards out of them as part of the installation for like in a gallery setting. Um, but I'm, I think I might just make a lot of accordion books out of all the prints or like a really, really, really long accordion book out of all the prints. Um, so that's kind of one idea because I keep looking at these images and they just, I don't know, there's some, like I really, with the darts and having them folded, the image is different than having it flat. And so I feel like there's something that's taken away from each individual image itself by having all those bright colors. So, so that's kind of where I'm at right now. Um, and then I was also, I wanted to show you all, this was another thing I was considering with um, potential format. So here's a video that I took when I was there of one of the books that thinking about that one slide that I showed you with the collage elements, because I have, I've made multiples of all these prints. So I was considering maybe making some, some uh, moving books potentially with some of the prints. Uh, so, or maybe just collaging them together so that they become a little bit more dimensional in their form. Cause I've, I've done a lot of bookmaking and I love pop-up books. That's my favorite and accordions. So like sculptural accordion books. So, so that's kind of what I'm throwing around and I'm definitely like open to feedback. If y'all are like, I don't like that one more than the other because I'm in the beginning phase of like, what are potential um, display methods, exhibition methods. And I've got a show coming up. So I'm going to do some experimentation with that on like a smaller scale. Um, so that's that book. Let's not play all, here it is. So the interviews there too, if anybody wants, it's it's like basically all the stuff I just said, but a lot shorter. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of where I'm at right now. Um, so I know it was a lot to kind of share at once, but I also like get really excited about sharing. And I think seeing that how things develop as as they come up, there there's just like a lot more involved in like the history and things. So so yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, if anybody has any questions, if you have the energy for them, I have the energy to answer them.